president and also um, a member of Toronto Field Naturalist Lecture Team, and I'll be your meeting host today. Let's begin by acknowledging the land and the people of the land. The Toronto Field Naturalists acknowledge that this land along the North Shore of Lake Ontario has for thousands of years been the traditional territory of the Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississauga of the Credit River. Further north, much further north these days, where the caribou roam, are traditional territories of many other Indigenous peoples. First Nations in Northern Canada have relied on caribou for millennia for food, clothing, and more. They followed, observed, and hunted the animals. They've seen changes in habits and populations as their territories face increasing development pressures. They've handed down knowledge through generations. Today, as we consider the caribou, we want to reflect also on the ancient relationships between this animal and the many First Nations that have always lived on the land together. We want to reflect on what's needed to safeguard those relationships and to keep caribou roaming across the land. So thanks very much to the whole lecture team for organizing today's event. Today we'll be hearing about the caribou, a species of superlatives, and we have a terrific guest speaker and, and I'll introduce uh, uh, Dr. Jim Schaefer in just a minute. But first let me welcome guests who are joining us today. This event has been shared on, on several portals aside from our TFN website. So we definitely may have people coming from across Ontario and perhaps further. So, so please feel free to let us know via the chat where you're located and what groups we've got joining us here today. And let me also just share a few Zoom tips. Um, we're recording this event this afternoon and that recording will be available online at TFN's website in future. Um, we'll be muting everyone during the lecture, and it's a good habit to just keep yourself muted unless you're about to ask a question. And also you can turn off your video, especially if you plan to be moving about because that reduces distractions for everyone else. After the presentation, I, I hope you'll stay to thank our speaker and to join in the discussion. And um, I'll also share some sneak peeks of upcoming events, so do stick around for that. So to ask a question, you'll have a few ways to be noticed. If you have your video on and you can see, um, if we can see your name, then we'll, you can just raise your hand and, and sort of wave it around, or you can use the raise hand feature in, um, in the, in, if you can click on reactions. You can also type your question in the chat feature and uh, between Sophia and, and uh, me, we will monitor that. So, so now I'm really delighted to introduce today's speaker. Jim Schaefer is a professor of biology at Trent University, where he teaches ecology, conservation biology, and communication science. He's founding director of the Trent Center for Communicating Conservation, a member of the International Boreal Conservation Science Panel, and a fellow with the Leopold Leadership Program, dedicated to conveying science to the public. If you search for caribou online, you will find Jim Schaefer's name again and again, whether featured on a CBC Ideas program or interviewed for Ontario Nature Magazine or Canadian Geographic or the Toronto Star. So Jim, we are really lucky to have you sharing your time with us today. And, and I hope that um, I've, I've made you co-host, so you should be able to um, now um, uh, take it away. Thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you for this invitation as well. I'm always delighted to talk about caribou what a fascinating animal and indeed i think as ellen said the land that's central as we'll find today keeping caribou is about keeping their habitat so i'm looking forward to that today and as co-host i can share my screen so let me begin with that so there we go and so an intriguing animal i think i've been studying caribou for decades and i've never failed to be fascinated by them. Also a magnificent animal, I think, as this photo by my friend and colleague Bill Duffett suggests. So I've got, I'm looking forward to your questions, particularly at the end of today's uh, talk, but I have a question to begin. And I think we have to address it first, is if we're going to talk about caribou, we need to ask this question, why? <laughs> why the disproportionate attention given to this animal? Well, I think it has to do because of this is that the connection of caribou with one species in particular, and that's our own. We look back through history and prehistory, caribou was the animal 
that allowed for the emergence of modern humans in Europe some 30,000 years ago. If we look at what people were eating at that time from their middens, some of it was almost 100% caribou. Caribou was the staple, particularly in rough times. Caribou was also emblazoned on the uniforms of the Newfoundland Regiment, and that animal was the one that they chose to commemorate their fallen. And even today, as Ellen was saying, there's an intimate connection of caribou, especially in the north, and in, especially with indigenous people. So caribou has a lot to do with people in particular. So today what I'd like to do is talk about caribou in the context of space and time and scale. And so I'm gonna begin with a little bit of background, a bit of natural history, which is fascinating in itself. We'll talk about how this animal, although one species is actually of two types, caribou with the boreal forest, caribou with the barrens. And then I'll talk a little bit about what we need to do to conserve caribou across the land. And so let's start with this as a little bit of natural history. And indeed, caribou are one of the most mobile pedestrians on the planet. As Anne Gunn says, they are creatures of space. I call them masters of movement. And indeed, when we take a look at the animal itself, caribou have literally been shaped by evolution to move and to move efficiently. One of the major features of that are their large hooves. They have a low foot loading, as we call it, which allows them to float on snow and on soft muskeg. And indeed, they move often thousands of kilometers per year. At the same time, <laughs> this begins from very early days. Caribou have what we call precocial calves. They have, among deer species, the most highly developed calves at a very young age. And so shortly after birth, a caribou is able to stand. Within a few hours, it's able to walk. And within a few days, I can assure you, a caribou calf can outrun even the fastest biologist. And we see this as well with our ability to track individual caribou uh, this, these days. They have the longest migrations on the planet. Here's just one individual female from the George River caribou herd. She was lovingly known as GR89118. And she was fitted with a satellite collar on the coast of Labrador here. And she ended up overwintering on the coast of Hudson Bay. And then one year later, after a long migration back, she calf, gave birth to her calf in almost exactly the same place where we had seen her for the first time. That was a trek of more than 4,000 kilometers. And caribou indeed are, have the longest migrations of any terrestrial animal on the planet. One of the expressions of using space is called the home range. That's the area that an animal will traverse over the course of a year. And we can compare caribou to other species of mammals. This is just a graph that each of these dots here is one species. And this is related to body size in this case. Obviously larger animals tend to have larger home ranges. But if we take a look <clears throat> at the top of that heap, both in absolute terms and in relative terms as well, are caribou. They have a home range that's about a hundred fold bigger than we would expect for an animal of that size. So immense areas that they use even over the course of one year, often home ranges in the thousands of square kilometers. And not surprisingly, evolution has given caribou uh, the ability to move efficiently as well. Here's another comparison across species from sheep to hippos. And what this is, is an expression of energy expenditure. You can think of this as the amount of energy to move one kilogram of body size for one kilometer. Obviously, larger animals are more efficient, but the least below that, the lowest below that line are caribou. For their body size, they use about 42% of the energy that we would expect for a 100 kilogram animal. So highly efficient, largely because of their ability, for example, to uh, conserve energy with the elasticity of their Achilles tendon. If you take a look at that graph very carefully, you see a species really close to caribou here, W. What species is that, do you think? W, warthogs, white-tailed deer. Well, how about this animal? Wildebeest, the other great migrator as well, also highly efficient in their ability to move efficiently across space. Another intriguing aspect of caribou is that 
Indeed, males have antlers, just like uh, other deer species, but caribou are unique amongst deer in that females also have antlers. And that's remarkable because antlers are deciduous. They are cast each year and regrown. So during the summer, when those antlers are growing, a female will be mobilizing the calcium and the phosphorus and the energy for milk for her calf. At the same time, she has to mobilize the energy and cost <laughs> phosphorus and calcium for growing antlers as well. So that's a remarkable adaptation. The reason we think that caribou have these antlers is that they use them as weapons, especially during wait, late winter. They're able to defend their feeding sites against bulls, for example, that have lost their antlers. So highly costly. Do you have pet caribou at home? Well, you know about some of those costs. Have a seat. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me clean that off you. Muffin's been shedding. And so there's a very precise etiquette now uh, that's grown up with uh, pet caribou, if you get my point. Okay, so that's the interesting parts about caribou. Of course, I want to talk about conservation. <clears throat> and indeed, caribou are declining. Not only are they declining, but their status is deteriorating across Canada. Here are some maps that uh, produced that by Justina Ray a few years ago and were published in Canadian Geographic. What you see there are different populations, and we call them designatable units of caribou across the country, red meaning endangered, uh, orange and yellow, special concern or threatened. If we take a look at 2004, yes, there are some concerns about populations, particularly peri caribou, but if we launch forward just a little bit more than a decade, we see more red, more orange. In other words, let me do that again, go back to 2004. By 2017, we have populations now that are largely in worse status than they were just 15 or so years ago. And so we're going to, I'm going to take a look at why that is and what we might do about it. But before we do that, I just want to take a look a little bit about the classification of caribou because that's important as well. And so, as I say here, caribou are one species, but there are different types of caribou. We call them ecotypes. And I want to draw attention to, in particular, to the importance of drawing lines between those types. And so <laughs> caribou cl classification is complex. And one thing I can impress upon you is that when we're talking about woodland caribou, for example, we're not talking about woodland caribou. It's one subspecies, but the subspecies don't really reflect carefully what we mean about caribou and their life histories. And so an important milestone in our development of understanding scientifically is that caribou largely can be classified as one of two types. And this is some work by Tom Bergerud some decades ago. What he said is that we can often distinguish between what he called a sedentary ecotype and a migratory ecotype. And caribou biologists agree on most things. We just don't often agree about how those labels. So sometimes sedentary caribou are called forest dwelling caribou or woodland caribou or boreal caribou. But we do distinguish them between migratory caribou, which are sometimes called forest tundra caribou or barren ground caribou or coastal caribou. And as those names suggest, one of the major differences is the degree of movements. And so relatively speaking, Sedentary caribou show short uh, distance movements compared to the long distance movements of migratory caribou. But the major distinguishing feature, as Tom Bergerud says, are what the females do at calving time in spring. So sedentary caribou living in the boreal forest year round disperse at calving. They go off and give birth to their calves in solitude. What Bergerud called that was spacing out. They're making themselves rare amongst the predators. On the other hand, migratory caribou do exactly the opposite. They band together, but they go north of tree line, away from wolves in that case. And what he said, so they aggregate at calving and caribou, as he said, space away from those predators. So we think both of those are strategies for females and especially their calves to make themselves less prone to predation. Okay, and though drawing those lines is crucial because that tells us what we need to conserve. In Ontario, for example, we have traditionally distinguished between the sedentary ecotype shown here in green and the migratory ecotype that exists further north. That came under some questions some few, a few years ago, and indeed it even reached the media where there were questions about whether or not are we talking about one kind of caribou in Ontario or two, 
And so the Ontario Forest Industries Association posed that question. They said that research by the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry suggested minimal differences between subspecies of caribou in Ontario. What they meant were the ecotypes. It's one subspecies, but two different types. And they said this as well, if there aren't actually two types, then it's incorrect to designate them one as threatened and not the other. So what evidence do we have, even though we distinguish between these two types, what evidence do we have in, in this province, for example, that indeed there's two ecotypes well, this is some work by Bruce Pond and his colleagues taking a look at this. This is actually the work by the Ministry of Resources and Forestry, and they had a very good set of observations based on tracking with of 140 caribou in northern Ontario that were tracked for uh, up to three years using GPS collars. And you can see those data there, more than almost a quarter uh, a million locations, so-called spaghetti map. Here's their movements here. So what Bruce did was take a look at the, for example, the annual distance that these animals traveled. And he, he predicted that if it was just one ecotype, we would see one bell curve. On the other hand, two ecotypes, we expect two bell curves. Well, what he found was indeed two bell curves, whether or not we looked at the annual distance traveled on the top here, or the average distance south of tree line, the second graph there, or at the bottom, especially the percent of locations in the Hudson Bay lowland, two ecotypes, two ecotypes, two ecotypes. In other words, we have some justification indeed to treat those kinds of caribou separately because of their different movements and their different life histories as well. And indeed, so two ecotypes. The other thing that we note is that once a female adopts a particular calving strategy, whether migrating or dispersing, then it appears to be permanent. In other words, we didn't see any switching between those two. And that's also supported by some genetic evidence that suggests that there was a split between those types, perhaps as long as seven millennia ago. So one species, but two different types, which is good news because that's the way I've organized the rest of this talk. <laughs> so let's consider one of those types first, the sedentary ecotype. These are caribou that inhabit the boreal forest year round. And what I want to emphasize here is the importance of scale or size. So these are the typical sedentary caribou, often very low density, but they live year round in the boreal forest. And so one of the things we note is the importance of space. This is one of the underlying features of caribou. It says, Anne Gunn says, they are creatures of space. Here's some work I did when I was regional biologist in Labrador some years ago, or we at least analyzed these data. These were some work by, uh, uh, that were done by a graduate student in advance of that. What you see here are some locations of 17 females at calving time. And we see that dispersed strategy. In other words, females went off to give birth to their calves, often in muskegs or on islands. And at that point, the whole herd occupied its entire range, about 20,000 square kilometers. And so a typical density would be about one female for 16 square kilometers. So very low density. These females we think we're making themselves rare to predators when they're giving birth to their calves. So space is important, but it's not just any space. What this is, uh, was some work that I did with Bill Pruitt on the east side of uh, Lake Winnipeg some years ago, my master's study, looking at the importance of old forests in particular. So what I did was to analyze the effect of what was called the Wallace Lake fire. This is this hatched area that you see there. It was about 60,000 hectares that had burned in 1980. And what you see there, the triangles and squares, these are caribou locations that we noticed during aerial surveys during winter. What we noticed is that four years after that fire, there was still a lot of occupancy of that burned area, but not so five years after fire. A lot of caribou moved north to the, to the northwest and they started occupying forests that were 55 years old, some older forests. And so our conclusion was that forests needed to be at least a half century old to be suitable caribou habitat. So not just huge spaces, but also old spaces as well. Sedentary caribou are in trouble. They're deemed a threatened species now in Canada and in Ontario. And once this, this is the Red Wine Mountains caribou population, the one that I showed you earlier. Here are just a series of surveys of population size that were done before, uh, during, and after my time in Labrador. 
And what we noticed is the population was relatively stable at about 750 animals up to 1989, but then a dramatic decline down to about 150. And since that time, that population has not recovered. So declining numbers that we see uh, expressed across the country. Here's another example, perhaps some of the most sobering data come from Alberta. Take a look at populations. There are 14 such populations that have been monitored for some decades. And there's three of them, at least at this point of this study, where we couldn't discern whether or not the population is growing or not. But 11 indeed showed negative growth. On average, about 8% per year declines in numbers. At that rate of decline, populations are being cut in half in numbers about every nine years. So obviously not sustainable. These are some of the evidence then that suggests that indeed support the idea that sedentary caribou are threatened. And why is that? Well, part of it has, stems from the very biology of caribou. We know that their reproductive rate is naturally low. Caribou rarely calf, and they often will not have a calf in every year. And so to make up for that low reproductive rate, the survival of adult females in particular needs to be very high for a population to persist. It needs to be on the order of 85% or higher survival per year. So I like this quote. I've, <laughs> I've mentioned Tom Berger some several times. I like this quote from him. He said, when we look at caribou populations, there's a fine balance between gains and losses. It doesn't take much then to tip that balance and have populations slide to lower numbers. And we've known this for quite a while. Another signature of the decline of caribou is geographic. And what we see in Ontario and elsewhere is what we call range collapse. What was used to be occupied ranges uh, haven't seen caribou in some decades now. And we've known this for a long time. Look at this publication it was published in the mid 20th century. And even by that point, there were large swaths of Northern Ontario that were now devoid of caribou. And so this northward range collapse indeed has been going on for quite a while. When we take a look at it across the country, we see that caribou were surprisingly far south. All the maritime provinces, several uh, New England states, even in Ontario down to uh, the Ottawa Valley and uh, margins of Georgian Bay as well. What we note is that that sedentary caribou now have lost, have been extirpated, that's a local extinction, in about 40% of their range. What has happened is that as we've, uh, as we've uh, marched north with our roads and industrial development, we see that recession of caribou that occurs at the same time. And indeed, if we take that map and overlay the uh, degree of fragmented forest, boreal forest, we see a Remarkable coincidence, as we have encroached on the boreal forest, caribou have disappeared as a result of that. This has been going on for quite a while. Indeed, now, at, if we take a look at historic caribou range in North America, Eastern North America, and where it was by the early 1980s, there's a swath of area that's about 400 kilometers wide where caribou are largely absent now. And it's hard to know when caribou disappeared, but if we take a look back through the 19th century at the last um, documented observation of caribou, we see that northward range recession. So the last caribou in Vermont was seen in 1840, in New Hampshire was 1881, Maine 1910, Nova Scotia 1912, Cape Breton 1925, and New Brunswick shortly thereafter. PI actually had caribou one time and they disappeared a little earlier in 1873. And that doesn't mean there's no caribou in that large swath, but what remains though are often fragmented and isolated populations. The Gaspé Z population, for example, is down to about 50 individuals, I believe, and they're considered endangered. So it's a crisis, but a crisis in slow motion it has been unfolding over the course of at least a century and a half. And this is just some geography, but if you take a look at caribou place names, for example, there are some dozens upon dozens of place names, including 10 caribou lakes in Northern Ontario that are now in that area, their caribou lost. Of course, uh, reserves are important 
and will be important in the conservation of caribou. But at the moment, we can also look across the country and see some of our largest parks, whether provincial parks like Quetico or national parks like Banff, they too have lost their caribou. So even some of our last largest parks on the order of several thousand square kilometers seem to be insufficient in themselves for conserving caribou. Why is this? Well, there's consensus amongst caribou biologists, and we found that the largest, the, the main reason for the decline of caribou is habitat loss, but it's complex. It's a slow tumbling of dominoes where we disturb the forest, for example, through roads or cutovers or seismic lines. That then invites greater abundance of other deer species like moose and white-tailed deer. And as a result of that, larger number of predators like black bears and wolves which then prey incidentally on caribou. And so this is habitat loss, but in the sense of habitat, not just of vegetation and the landscape, but the fauna as well, that is to allow for the decline of caribou across the landscape. The other thing to note is that importance of scale is that caribou respond to those habitat changes then at surprisingly large scales. This is some work I did with Shane Mahoney some years ago, looking at the effect of what the Star Lake hydro development, which involved a dam and a, a road in uh, West Central Newfoundland. And it occurred precisely on the migration path of the Buckins herd. And so what we did was to take a look at caribou in that area, not just after construction, but before and during construction as well. And what we found was caribou responded at remarkably large scales. Here's just a graph that, uh, that shows you that. What we can do is take a look at the proportion of animals at various distances from the project, zero to three kilometers, three to six, six to nine, nine to 12 kilometers. And what we note is before the project, about half the animals would come into that area. But after construction, that declined by about 50%. And indeed, that's three kilometers from the project. There's even some indication that as far as six or even nine kilometers away, there was some loss in occupancy. So caribou often distance themselves away from these projects at not just a few hundred meters, but often several kilometers. And indeed, if you look across the country, we can take a look at what's called effective habitat loss. This is the movement of caribou away from those kinds of developments, often on the order of kilometers. Two to five kilometers are not uncommon, sometimes even more. And so this gives a different sense to edge effects. We often think of human perceptions that can't be more than a few hundred meters. What caribou are telling us is that no, the effective habitat loss may be much broader than that. And it doesn't mean they never are in there. So caribou do occasionally go across roads, for example, but their occupancy is much less than it would be if there was no such road. And so I like this idea this, uh, that we need to take a broader sense of what we mean by habitat. Uh, a few years ago, one of my colleagues, Jerry Racy, said this. He said, if we take that broader view, yes, caribou use islands. We know that. They often give birth to their calves on islands. But in a broader sense, then, water is caribou habitat. It's not just the islands themselves. It's the surrounding area as well that's also part of caribou habitat. So if we're going to understand caribou and their habitat, we need to take that broader view. Most recently, we've done some work as scientists, and I was initially part of this, some of this work, taking a look at what, how can we define critical habitat? Because that, as you probably know, was part of the Species at Risk Act, the federal act. We need some such definition. And I love this quote because we had some work that we could uh, lean on already. Emerging problems are more easily dealt with when basic research has already been done. In recent years, our ability to respond to problems such as palm, mountain pine beetle or SARS, let me add COVID-19 as well, has depended on pre-existing research programs. In other words, in anticipation of problems, we need a scientist to have developed some basic understanding. And so this was true in the case of trying to define critical habitat for sedentary caribou. So this is some work originally uh, spearheaded by Environment Canada, and most recently updated and refined by Cheryl uh, Johnson and her colleagues. And what they did was to assemble information, not just from one uh, population, but from 58 caribou populations from across their range, right from the Northwest Territories to Labrador. Uh, 
what they did was to relate population condition to habitat condition. By population condition, that was um, expressed as recruitment. This is the addition of new animals to the adult population. And it can be expressed as the number of calves per 100 females, for example. And what they did was to relate that to habitat condition on the basis of human disturbance. What we'd expect then is some kind of negative response. In other words, when there was more disturbance, we expect lower recruitment. Recruitment is related then to population growth as well. And that's exactly what they found. Somewhat complex because fire was also involved, but generally where populations was experiencing more disturbance, the recruitment was lower. Where disturbance was low, then they had higher recruitment. Each one of these is a population. There's also some effect of fire disturbance as well, but overridingly, the human disturbance was the most important feature governing recruitment. Let me just give you a couple of examples. We take a look at one end of the spectrum. This is the Lac Joseph herd. This was a population in Labrador. It was adjacent to that Red Wine Mountains herd that I showed you earlier. If we take a look at its range here, we see in red some areas that were burned. There's a rail line and a small road, but are more or less the population's range was largely intact. At the other end of the spectrum in Alberta, the Little Smoky herd, large areas of disturbance due to uh, pipeline, well sites, seismic lines, cut blocks, and roads. Not surprisingly, then, the recruitment of that population was very low. And so important relationship then, because this gives us a sense of what caribou need with regard to critical habitat. What do their populations need for persistence? And it also gives us some guidance. What it suggests to us is what at least is the minimum that we need to keep intact for caribou to persist. Because we know for a population to be stable, in other words, not growing or not declining, we need about 28 or 30 or so calves per 100 females. And from that, we can at least get a rule of thumb that, oh, well, at least no more than about, what, 15 or 20% of the herd's range can be disturbed. What that tells us is that we need to add up all those disturbances rather than look at them piecemeal. But also what it tells us is that indeed, we can have caribou and some industrial development. In other words, we don't need to have, it's not entirely going to be off limits to development, but we need to add those up and also buffer for some uncertainties as well. So some guidance, this critical habitat uh, definition gives us some guidance about what we knew, need to do to keep caribou. Okay, so that's caribou the boreal forest. I also want, I think be remiss if we didn't talk about caribou the barrens as well. And well, these are the large migratory herds that people often think of. And I'm going to emphasize again, the importance of space and scale. So these are the iconic herds that I read about when I was young, reading Mowat and Duncan Pride about the great throngs of caribou uh, that were members of the migratory ecotype. This is why I long to go north and see these for myself. And indeed, they're still there. We now define them largely on the basis of their calving grounds. And so you may be familiar, for example, with the porcupine herd. This is the herd that's often in the news. It straddles the Alaska-Yukon border. And by chance, their calving grounds tend to be in the, in the same area as a large oil reserve. What I want to talk about, though, is this population at the eastern edge. This is the George River caribou herd. And I had the pleasure when I was regional biologist in Labrador of studying this herd and seeing this herd. So I want to talk about it in particular. And indeed, at one point when I was there, the George River herd was the largest caribou herd on the planet. At its peak, it occupied that area, that large area, 700,000 square kilometers in Quebec, Labrador. That's an area five times the size of the maritime provinces combined. And we've learned a great deal about caribou biology by studying the George River herd. Tom Berger was rather prescient in, back in 1967. He said that indeed the George River herd, that re represents a unique opportunity to explore natural population controls. In other words, a unique opportunity to learn about the population biology of migratory caribou. Back in those days, 
we take a look at the population size, there were some 62,000 animals in the George River herd in 1963. And the rise of the herd, I think, was unforeseen, at least by scientists. It grew to almost or more than three quarters of a million animals by the mid early 1990s. And so we had never witnessed, witnessed this as scientists that population could rise of so quickly and at such magnitude. I have trouble trying to fathom this, but if we look at the population when it was first uh, estimated in its size in 1954, if that represents the George River caribou herd in 1954, that's the size that it reached in 1993. So about a hundred fold increase in just a few decades. Well, of course, no population grows forever. The population has also declined. And again, I think for scientists, we didn't anticipate neither the speed nor the magnitude of that decline. The population now has declined from about three quarters of a million down to less than 9,000. By the way, this is not the reason that I left Labrador. <laughs> but nonetheless, it was indeed unprecedented, at least for caribou biologists, to have seen such a decline. And so a 99% decline, of course, this has had important implications for harvesting, for example, and what we're going to do with this herd to keep it, uh, keep it on the landscape in the coming decades. So if there's the population in 1993, it is now shrunk down to a much smaller size, only about 1% of its original size just a few decades ago. Why? Why have these, why did that caribou herd quit growing? Well, I think Berger again was prescient because what this gave us was an inkling or an indication of regu what we call regulatory factors, what keeps populations within bounds. And here's a hint of what that is. Here's some work by my colleague, Serge Couturier, looking at the jawbone length of, of adult females. So these are animals that have been harvested, but their jaws have then been submitted and measured. The important point was this duration here from about the late or mid 1970s to the early late, uh, uh, late 1980s. This is when the population quit growing. And what we see were smaller and smaller and smaller mandibles, suggesting that indeed we had smaller and smaller and smaller animals. This, those mandibles were decreasing on average in size about one and a half millimeters per year. That suggests perhaps some kind of nutritional limitation. And indeed, when we take a look at the range, at the calving grounds, what we see was a huge area, some tens of thousands of square kilometers that were depleted of food due to grazing and trampling. So females would return to those calving grounds in their thousands, sometimes in their hundreds of thousands each and every year. And so if we take a look of like measures of the amount of broken twigs or shattered lichens or turf or the degradation of birch, these are important foods for caribou, what we saw then was degradation of summer food. And that was revolutionary. I think intuitively most people would think winter food would be the limiting factor for migratory caribou. What we learned was indeed it appears to be summer food that limited or regulated the size of the George River caribou herd. So regulation by competition for summer food by returning to those calving grounds year after year after year, caribou then grazed and trampled and browsed that food to the point where their own numbers began to decline. The other thing we learned, this perhaps is no surprise, is that when the George River caribou herd increased in numbers, it also increased in the area that it occupied. And so here's a map based on some of Bergerud's work, looking at the years where caribou had not been seen perhaps for many decades, where they were moving further west further south, further north, in virtually every direction. And so this gives us some inkling because we'd like to know, has this been the case, this rise and fall of the herd, has this been the case over the, uh, over the centuries? And so what Bergerud did was to take a look in particular along the Hudson Bay coast. What he did was to take a look at old reports from Moravian missionaries, from Hudson Bay company journals, and he just, noted then over the last few centuries, when were people seeing caribou in abundance? So what I've done here is just make a graph of that. He didn't graph it, but this is qualitative. 
what have been the trends over those, at least since the 1750s or so. And what we can infer is something like this, is that indeed caribou were at some high in the mid 18th century, again at the beginning of the 20th century, and here's the more recent rise and fall as well. And so what it suggests is hmm, perhaps cycles, but certainly rises and falls in caribou numbers is probably inherent in many uh, migratory caribou populations. Another piece of evidence that I really like, this is some work by Serge Payette and coworkers at University of Laval. What they did was very intriguing. What they did was take a look at what they called trampling scars. And so when caribou cross an area, for example, right here, there may be roots of spruce or tamarack. And when caribou cross in their thousands, they will damage those roots and they leave a telltale tie sign of when they did it. And so by taking a cross section of that wood, we can infer that there were caribou there, at least probably in their abundance in 1904, and again in 1973. And what we see from his analysis, again, is qualitative. What he did note, we see the rise in the late 20th century, but also the fall in the early 20th century, as well as perhaps a plateau that we didn't know. So whether it's, it's trees or historical accounts, what we see is that migratory caribou, like the George River herd, probably have gone through rises and falls on the order of decades for a long, long time. So I love this quote by George Califf. He says that caribou herds, they're like a geological force as they flow over the land. They dominate the landscape and the lives of people who hunt and depend on them. Indeed, when you have three quarters of a million caribou, that's going to be a geological, biological, and ecological force. For example, I told you that antlers are deciduous. We can just imagine some half a million or three quarters of a million pairs of antlers being grown and cast and just the redistribution of calcium that might affect a species that is perhaps short on calcium like porcupines. Okay, so there's some about the biology of this animal, about the ecotypes, but I do wanna talk about conservation because to my mind, caribou are perhaps the most formidable conservation challenge that we have in this country. So what are we going to do? Well, I wanna talk not just about what we have learned about caribou, but what we might learn from caribou, because I think that's important. And one is this, is that we often think of limitless abundance, whether it's Northern cod or Plains bison or white pine, we now realize that there are limits to limitless abundance. And we have to realize that even common species can disappear. And so that's lesson number one. And the other is that when we, how we define a problem often has or governs the solutions we might consider. And so more and more people are considering solutions for trying to keep caribou. This was a, pres uh, a proposal in Alberta. I think Quebec is just now it's the same kind of thing is that by trying to keep caribou, they're going to build a fence, try to keep predators out. The problem with that, at least in my mind, is that it doesn't, diag it doesn't address the cause, just one of the symptoms. Yes, we have more predators as a result uh, that ca or are causing decline of caribou, but that is only a symptom of the habitat changes that have uh, ensued. And so fencing them in is what's called a halfway technology. It doesn't address the root cause, but only some of the symptoms. And so is it jobs versus caribou? I like this quote as well by Jane Lubchenco. She wasn't talking about caribou, but she was talking about environmental problems per se. And she said, there's a false assertion that we as society must choose between the economy and the environment. What she said was, in reality, this jobs versus environment choice is false. The real choice is a matter of scale. It's between short-term gain and long-term sustained prosperity. In other words, if we want to keep caribou, that's actually in our interest if we're interested in long-term sustained prosperity. They are an indicator species, not just of connectivity, for example, of the boreal forest, but perhaps of the sustainability of our resource exploitation as well. It's one of the things I've learned is that conservation, it is as simple and as difficult as taking the long view. And we're, we're told that when we're knee high, 
don't, don't, <laughs> to our parents, don't we? As children, we're told, take the long view. I bet in these talks, you've never seen an excerpt from Richard Scarry. Well, I took one. This is from Richard Scarry's ABCs that just underlies the perils of short-term thinking. And H is for whole. Here's the lesson. Haggis has a hole in his roof. He never fixed it because on rainy days, it's too wet to work. And on sunny days, well, it doesn't need fixing. In other words, we need to take the long view, not only for fixing a hole in our roof, but if we're going to conserve caribou as well. And so what do we learn from this animal? I think a lot. One is that the importance of scale and long-term thinking. And as Anthony King, the landscape ecologist said, we, you and I, we're prisoners of perspective. I think that's true. Our adult lives are what? Half a century, perhaps a little longer. And we tend to stick pretty close to home. And so I see in Caribou an invitation, an invitation to break out of that prison and accept a longer view, a wider view. Fast spaces are important. If we're going to conserve Caribou, we need to take a look at the landscape in its broad sense, beyond what I call parcel perceptions of habitats and consider habitat as whole landscapes, whole watersheds, for example. That's true in space. It's also true in time. If we're going to conserve caribou, then we need to move beyond just multi-year plans, perhaps even our individual careers and accept a much longer view. In other words, we need to have a, a view in space and time that's on par with caribou biology. If we do that, then I'm quite optimistic that we'll be able to conserve this animal. Well, when India talk, my supervisor, Bill Pruitt said, always have a sunset, sunset shot. And so I did that. And look at that. I was able to get the animal in it as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. Wow. Jim, thank you so much. Um, that is, uh, you, you, you are such a, a gifted speaker on behalf of this species and, and, uh, and you've got a really philosophical approach um, and, and it, it really, really, it, it can't help making us think, um, you know, not just, not just about caribou, which, which are our animal as, as Canadians, um, but, but about other species that, um, you know, that, might, that you might actually find, for example, in our local ecosystem here in the, in the Toronto area and, and in, in Trent, as, in the Trent area as well. Um, you know, I think, of, I think of monarchs, very common species, great, huge migratory uh, behavior. Uh, I think of the American eel, um, was an enormously common uh, uh, aquatic species, represented half the biomass in the, in the lower Great Lakes in some areas. Um, enormous migratory uh, behavior, um, incredibly threatened and, and incredibly at risk now. Um, so, so there's just, you, you've created so many sparks by your talk, um, and I'm sure that's true for, for many of, of the people we've got here. So, so um, I'm going to put us on a gallery view now and, and see how the questions come in, and, uh, and you can also use the, the chat. Um, and uh, I mean, I, you know, I, and as as people are formulating those those questions, uh, there's there's certainly one that that comes to mind for me, because we've got 